Okay, I am going to, I've started recording, so thank you so much everyone for joining us today for um, our 2023 Speak for Health Advocacy webinar for leaders. As you can see, um, we've invited uh, a lot of people who serve in some leadership capacity for APHA, and that's in the hope that not only you will join us in our Speak for Health campaign next month to get involved in a lot of advocacy activities, but that you'll share some of the things that we talk about and some of the links and some of the resources with, with your groups and with your networks to try to get the people that you work with involved in public health advocacy as well. So before we get started, um, just to go over what the Speak for Health campaign is, it's a moment that we take during con Congress's August recess to just try to get the huge amount of um, APHA members that we have who are public health professionals and public health workers and public health scientists to use all of that like vast wealth of knowledge for advocacy and join us in the advocacy that we do um, on some of our public health priorities. So over the course of the month, we'll be sending emails out to everyone, just highlighting how you can get involved and what some of the resources we have are to help you do that. So starting us off today is my colleague, Don Hopper, who's going to run through what our priorities are for the 118th Congress. Um, and this will be a good way to just get a, a handle on what we'll be talking about in the next month as we engage in advocacy and as you hopefully join us. So I'll pass it to Don. Thanks, Jordan. And Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I, as Jordan mentioned, I am going to do an overview of our 2023 priorities. Um, each year, we come up with a list of priorities. Some of them are kind of always on our list, um, but we try to pick issues that are broad, um, that are um, that we know that Congress and the administration is going to be addressing in the upcoming year, um, uh, because we want, um, as Jordan said, because we have a broad, diverse, and large membership, we want all of our uh, members to kind of see their lane when it comes to advocating for APHA uh, within our priority issues. So a quick overview. Um, increasing funding for vital public health agencies and programs and strengthening the nation's public health infrastructure. That's one, of, as I mentioned, that's one of the priorities that is always on APHA's list. Upholding the Affordable Care Act and expanding access to health coverage and services, addressing the health impacts of climate change, upholding critical public health laws and regulations, addressing the nation's gun violence epidemic, reauthorizing the child nutrition programs at the federal level and the farm bill uh, to include strong nutrition and public health provisions, supporting access to all reproductive health services and prioritizing racial and health equity through, throughout each of those priority areas and all the other um, legislative and regulatory um, and judicial related uh, things that APHA works on. I mentioned um, public health funding and strengthening public health infrastructure as being uh, a priority every year. Um, primary focus for APHA is on increasing funding for CDC and HRSA. We actually lead two coalitions, the Friends of HRSA and CDC Coalition that specifically work with our other partner organizations to increase the top line funding levels for both of those agencies. Because we all know, unless CDC and HRSA have robust funding, uh, Congress is not going to be able to fund the various programs um, and centers and other important um, uh, efforts that those agencies are undertaking. So um, advocating for that top line funding is, uh, is critical. Um, this year, we're asking for $11.581 billion for CDC and $10.5 billion for HRSA. I should say that those numbers were developed before Congress um, agreed with the administration on a debt ceiling agreement, uh, which unfortunately did cap funding for the next two fiscal years. 
So likely the highest that Congress is going to be able to go for CDC and HRSA is roughly level funding. There might be some opportunities for slight increases for some of the programs, um, but considering what we could have faced, um, it could have been worse. Let's put it that way. And an example of how it could have been worse um, is what recently came out of the House of Representatives Appropriations Committee. Uh, that committee uh, in the House uh, put forward its labor HHS education bill, which is the bill that funds CDC, HRSA, NIH, SAMHSA, ARC, all the federal uh, discretionary public health agencies, and proposes a $1.6 billion cut to CDC and a $700 million cut to HRSA. The Senate Appropriations Committee is actually taking up their version of the bill today. So we're still awaiting, um, as we speak, they're actually marking up those bills. Um, but we have not received the report or the bill text. So we're, we're unclear right now what the funding levels for CDC and HRSA will be in that bill. However, they will be nothing as bad as what we saw in the House. So bottom line is we're probably going to end up in a continuing resolution, which is when Congress passes a bill to keep funding at the current level because the fiscal year ends at the end of September and the likelihood of the House and the Senate reconciling their very different bills before September 30th is very slim. The other thing we could potentially face is a government shutdown. I wouldn't take it off the table. Uh, I think it could very well happen. Hopefully if it does, it won't be a long drawn out uh, process, but it's very unclear at this time um, how this is going to happen and how Congress is going to get all this work they need to get done by September 30th done. So stay tuned for more information on that. And this is one reason why it's going to be so important for APHA members to be talking to their members of Congress over the August recess about the importance of public health funding and why we need robust funding um, because we are facing these looming deadlines. APHA, I mentioned public health infrastructure, we're also supporting legislation that would create a mandatory $4.5 billion fund for core public health infrastructure. This is something that Senator Patty Murray has introduced in the last couple of Congresses. She's reintroducing the bill, probably not going to move forward this year, but it is a good marker bill to have introduced to continue to show the need uh, for additional funding for public health infrastructure. So APHA will be supporting that effort again this year. And of course, we're hopefully all of you are aware of the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which was created by the ACA. That fund will provide $1.2 billion in mandatory funding for public health this year. Much of that funding will go to CDC. Um, however, some of it does go to other agencies as well. So we're awaiting the details on that, um, the allocation of that funding um, in both the House and Senate bills, uh, but we should have the information soon. Mentioned upholding the ACA, um, the prevention fund, as I said, is part of that. Um, we have on a number of occasions, I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, supported the ACE, well, we supported the ACA when it was first um, introduced and passed, um, but we've also defended it in the courts um, on a number of occasions. I'm sure you all have seen the many times that either previous Congresses have tried to repeal the ACA and or uh, various organizations have challenged the ACA in the courts. Um, we've won some, we've lost some. Luckily, we've won most of the cases uh, to defeat efforts <laughs> to challenge the ACA and various parts of that uh, in the courts, but we're currently involved in yet another one, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we're also focusing on addressing the health impacts of climate change. Um, our, one of our primary focuses is increasing funding for CDC's climate and health program. Unfortunately, the House bill that I mentioned earlier proposes to eliminate that funding. We'll see what the Senate bill says. I would guess at a minimum, the Senate bill will probably level fund the program, and that may be uh, the best we're going to get this year, given, again, those budget caps and the, the, the differences between the House and the Senate, but we are still advocating for increasing that funding. Um, we're also working to support um, 
uh, various legislative and regulatory efforts to um, clean up major sources of pollution from the power sector, for example. Um, tomorrow, we will be having an action alert that's going out to all APHA members, urging them uh, to submit comments to the US EPA, um, urging them to, EPA has announced a, a proposed rule to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the, from the power sector. This is after the Supreme Court ruled last year that the previous attempt um, by EPA uh, was too broad. So EPA went back to the drawing board and came up with a new plan that's out for public comment right now. Um, APHA will be supporting that, but urging EPA to do everything it can to ensure that the final rule is the most protective of public health and that it um, adequately takes into account um, the health and well-being, particularly of those communities that are located near power facilities. So ensuring that um, that those communities are don't see worse air pollution um, through the rule. So uh, we will be weighing in, as I said, with our partner organizations from the federal level, but this will be an opportunity for APHA members um, to also submit comments to EPA on this important rule. Uh, addressing the nation's gun violence epidemic, we are conti we're continuing to support uh, the funding that the CDC and the National Institutes of Health have received over the last two years um, to undertake research into gun violence prevention efforts. Uh, currently, both of those agencies receive $12.5 million. We're asking for CDC to receive 35 million and for NIH to receive 25 million uh, in this year's bill. Again, that request was made before this budget cap uh, deal uh, went into effect, unfortunately. You're going to notice a pattern here. The House bill that came out earlier eliminates the funding from both of those agencies. So we expect that the Senate bill will at least level fund them at the current $12.5 million. Um, but we're hopeful that there could be some, uh, some increase in the Senate bill. And once we see the bill text and the report, hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have more information on that. But we do not expect it to be eliminated. So that is the good news. Um, so at least we have the Senate um putting out a bill that shows that they want to continue supporting that important research we also support other measures um, that unfortunately won't move probably this congress because the house won't likely take them up and that includes requiring universal background checks um, for all gun purchases reinstating the federal ban on assault weapons and high capacity magazines um, and we also support legislation that would allow for the removal of guns from those who are deemed to be potentially harmful to themselves or others through the issuance of extreme risk protection orders some states already have this in place some do not um, there is, there has been legislation uh, introduced that would allow federal courts to issue these uh, types of orders. Um, but again, unlikely that this this legislation will move forward this year. And if I could just remind folks to make sure that your line is muted. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned upholding critical public health laws and regulations. Um, I'm pleased to inform you that thanks to APA's, APHA's intervention with the Lung, American Lung Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics, the, um, we challenged um, an effort um, by the Trump administration to weaken the rule that um, limits mercury and other air toxic emissions from the power sector. Um, that uh, that challenge was put on hold when the Biden administration came into uh, office because the Biden administration's EPA um, developed a rule to reinstate uh, the parts of that important rule that the Trump administration had eliminated. Um, and I'm pleased to inform you that that um, uh, basically what the Trump administration did was removed the appropriate and necessary finding um, provision of the rule, which basically says the rule was appropriate and necessary to protect public health, which is 
kind of ridiculous that they would want to remove that, but they did. Um, but this administration has reinstated that provision. And so our lawsuit was um, withdrawn. Uh, and in addition, I mentioned the ACA and the challenges to the ACA, APHA, and public health deans and scholars uh, from across the country have um, submitted a variety of briefs related to the ACA to support the law. The most recent one that is currently pending in the federal courts is a challenge to the coverage of preventive health benefits under the ACA. Um, and you all, I'm sure, are familiar with that when you go to your doctor and you don't have to pay for specific tests or per, per specific uh, prescription. Um, that's because the ACA tells insurers that if it's for certain preventive benefits, health benefits, that ins your insurance company has to foot the bill and there can't be a copay uh, related to that. Um, and that's being challenged. Um, so... It's received, uh, it received a bad ruling in a Texas district court, which was not a surprise. The same court has made other bad rulings on the ACA. Eventually, this is probably going to be appealed up to the Supreme Court. APHA and the deans did submit a brief supporting the coverage for these benefits in the ACA, and we will continue to defend them um, as, the, um, as the challenge moves uh, through the appeals process. Child Nutrition and Farm Bill, um, ensuring key provisions, ensuring that kids obviously have access to healthy foods in schools. We made a lot of progress on child nutrition standards over the last um, couple reauthorizations. So we want to at least hold ground on those and not weaken any of those, those provisions. And we'd like to see them strengthen. Uh, we'll continue to support programs like SNAP and WIC that increase families' access to healthy food and allow program flexibilities to remove barriers to access, aligning federal nutrition programs with dietary guidelines for Americans, and supporting a 2023 farm bill that includes strengthened benefit levels for SNAP provisions to increase equitable access to healthy food, strengthen nutrition education, and research investments to improve nutrition security. Related to reproductive health, uh, APHA has endorsed once again the Women's Health Protection Act that would more or less codify the Roe v. Wade decision into federal law. So women would have the right at the federal level to act, have access to abortion services. Sadly, that bill is probably not going to move through this Congress, um, but a number of states are doing uh, their own, um, undertaking their own efforts related to women's um, access to abortion. So if you're not a member of your affiliate or you want to be a member of your affiliate or you want to learn if your affiliate's working on these issues, I would encourage you to, to talk to your affiliates. And we also, um, of course, support uh, federal funding for reproductive health uh, services and programs such as the Title X Family Planning Program, which and you won't be surprised to hear this, was eliminated in the House version of the Labor HHS bill. Again, we don't expect the Senate bill um, to do this, but um, it's going to be a, just another example of how there's going to be a big difference between what the House and Senate are proposing this year. And then just a few other issues, um, because when we talk about our priorities at APHA, we want to be clear that those are the areas that Jordan and I, as the government relations department, spend most of our time on, but we work on a lot of issues beyond that. Now, our hope is that our members um, will focus on at least one of the priority one of the priority issues when you undertake your uh, speak for health activities uh, over the August recess, but you can certainly weigh in on other public health issues when you do that. Um, just make sure you leave enough time to talk about the priority issue that you want to discuss, and then you can of course feel free to talk about other important public health issues that you want your uh, federal legislation le legislators and or their staff to be informed about. So this is just a list of uh, a few of the other issues that we're working on reauthorize reauthorization of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. This is another thing that is supposed to be done by the end of September, and the House and Senate have very different bills that they're proposing. Um, so 
I'm not so confident that's going to get done. So it's probably something that we'll continue to work on into the fall. Tobacco control issues. Uh, APHA is planning to weigh in on EPA's new proposed lead dust rule. Um, EPA is also going to be proposing a new clean water rule that um, would replace the one that was struck down by the Supreme Court recently. Uh, we have weighed in on anti-LGBTQ issues. Uh, there have been a number of policy writers included in a number of the appropriations bills um, related to this issue. Um, and so those are going to end up having to be resolved by another reason that getting the appropriations bills done by the end of September is going to be a challenge um, and maternal health issues. So I'll take a couple minutes for a couple questions on the priority issues, but the the real reason we have you <laughs> on the call today is to hear uh, from Jordan about what you can do to advocate for these issues. And we can, of course, take more questions when when after Jordan's presentation. But if anybody has questions now related to anything that I covered, I'm happy to take those. And as I said, if not, you can certainly uh, Hang on to your question till the end of the of the webinar. Okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and kick it over to back over to Jordan, uh, who's going to talk about the uh, kind of tools and other resources that APHA will provide for you, um, so you can participate in the Speak for Health campaign. Jordan. Thanks, Don. So I will now start sharing my screen. And we'll get started um, talking about the Speak for Health campaign and how you can be a part of that. So just as a quick overview of what Speak for Health is, um, it's a campaign where we try to boost the advocacy done by the many amazing members of APHA. Um, like I said earlier, we have thousands and thousands of APHA members who are public health experts, public health workers, public health professionals, public health advocates, public health scientists, and we want to leverage that massive amount of expertise and passion and enthusiasm into federal advocacy efforts. We focus on the August time period because as many of you know, I'm sure both the Senate and House go on August recess each year, and those members of Congress are returning to their districts, which makes setting up meetings with them or attending in-person town halls a lot easier. Um, and members of Congress are also, besides the fact that they're in district, they also just um, tend to be a little more available and less busy because there aren't hearings and markups and votes happening in their schedule. So this is the perfect time to hit them with all of your public health questions. So what we do during that time period to try to boost your advocacy efforts, we, on a weekly basis throughout the August recess, which starts next week, we'll be sending out emails, sharing resources, tools, and materials that you guys can use to boost your advocacy efforts, as well as talking a little bit more in depth about some of those priority issues that Don just mentioned. So you can look out for those emails, but if you want a sneak peek or just want to go ahead and do it yourself, all the materials we'll be sharing are already accessible at the Speak for Health website. So that's linked here in this slide, and I will be sending both the slides and the recordings out to everybody who's RSVP, whose emails I have. Um, but you can also just find that very quickly by typing in Google APHA Speak for Health. So now I'm gonna go through some of the activities that you can do um, to be a public health advocate. Some of them are super easy. Some of them require a little bit more effort, but there's a lot of options. So you can do one or um, you can be an overachiever and do all of the above. So we'll start with action alerts. This is truly the easiest thing that you can do as an advocate because it's a message that we've already written and is posted on the website. So at the link below, you can check out our action alerts. They're also posted on APHA's policy and advocacy page. 
essentially we have pre-written these messages on certain issues like health equity, climate change, gun violence. As Don mentioned earlier, there's one that's on the website now that you'll all be getting an email about tomorrow on EPA regulations and um, environmental protection. So essentially, when you click on a action alert, it asks you to fill in your zip code and where you live so that it can decide where, um, who your members of Congress are. And then you're presented with the message, which like I said, is pre-written and you can just send it straight to your members of Congress. It's a few clicks of a process. But we do highlight the importance of editing that message a little bit. So it's always going to be a little bit more influential if you put your own twist on it, right? Add in your own story, add in your own expertise from the work that you do, um, kind of change it up a little bit. Because, you know, if we get 200 members of APHA to send an action alert about this EPA regulation, and they're all the exact same message, you know, that's pretty compelling, but it's even more compelling if a member of Congress is receiving 200 different well-crafted personal messages about an EPA regulation. So we definitely recommend customizing it. Action alerts can also just be helpful as a script. If you want, like, if you want to send it and then do more with it, you know, you could call up an office and kind of read some important sentences from that action alert and use that to kind of guide a conversation. There's a lot of ways that they can be helpful. And we post new action alerts as new issues are developing. So as you check back in the future, there might be new, um, new and exciting things posted on the action alert page. So keep an eye out there. Another thing you can do during the Speak for Health campaign is attend town halls. So uh, pretty much all members of Congress have town halls set on their calendar. Some of those are virtual Zoom town halls. Some of those are telephone town halls. And sometimes they have in-person town halls in their district as well. These are a great place um, for constituents to ask questions to their members of Congress. And in our case, of course, we want um, constituents to target their members with questions about public health. And so we have some sample questions for public forums and town halls. Those are actually, we have an updated version of that for 2023 that's going to be posted online this week. And essentially, they just walk through some of our priority issues. So if you wanted to attend a town hall and ask your member of Congress about their commitment to increasing public health funding or their commitment to defending abortion access and reproductive health, we have questions that will start you off there. Of course, if you want to get more detailed in your question, that's something we would love to see. But these are kind of will help get you started and kind of guide you in those conversations because we do. We want those town halls to be a place where members are being held accountable for their commitment to public health. Once again, this is something that's posted on the Speak for Health website and you can access there. Another fun and exciting thing, um, if you have a bit of a creative streak, is writing an op-ed. So this is a really fun way to not just get the attention of, you know, potentially your members of Congress, but of everybody in your community who reads the newspaper or the websites where those newspapers live. Um, so op-eds are a great way, like I said before, just to leverage the incredible amount of public health expertise that you all have. What we recommend is that once you've written a, an op-ed on potentially one of our priorities, whether it be public health funding or climate change or gun violence, that you then submit that op-ed to probably a smaller or local paper. Um, of course, we would love to see something placed in the New York Times, but the reality is that you're going to be a lot more successful trying to place an op-ed in some of those smaller papers that don't get as much submissions. And that way, if it's a local paper somewhere where you live and that's your hometown, you can craft the op-ed towards your specific geographic location. For instance, if you were submitting an op-ed um, on the topic of reproductive health, you could mention, you know, in our state where we live, the legislature has introduced this many bills attacking abortion access, this many bills attacking contraception. So targeting the smaller local papers allows you to like specify the op-ed toward your geographic area when you're discussing that issue. Or if you wrote one on public health funding, you could say, you know, 
our state received this much funding from CDC and HRSA in 2022. Our community was greatly reliant upon that, and that's why we need to continue advocating for public health funding. Another reason it's good to target local papers is just because, you know, that might not be an area that gets a lot of articles in their newspaper about public health. Um, so you might be bringing a perspective that the community doesn't get to see quite as often. We have some op-ed writing tips posted on the website and linked here, um, which provide some suggestions, not just how to write an op-ed, but how to submit that to your local paper. So those are super helpful. Um, and for somebody who's looking for some guidance, maybe hasn't done this before, we also have some draft op-eds that we have already written and can kind of get you started. Of course, this is another situation where we would love to see you personalize it, add in facts and figures about your own area, but we have those op-ed templates on the topics of public health funding, climate change, gun violence prevention, and reproductive health. Um, so this is actually something, those templates are not posted on the website. There's a whole thing about some newspapers when they receive op-eds, do like a web search to see if you've gotten it from somewhere else. So if we posted it on the website, they would potentially just reject it immediately. So we get around that by having those available at the speak for health at APHA.org email. So if um, you're interested in accessing one of those draft op-eds, you can email that email um, and we will send that along to you. Um, we actually got some, some exciting and successfully placed op-eds last year um, in 2022 Speak for Health campaign. So it's definitely possible for these newspapers to like pay attention and pick these up um, and you know get the word out in your community about public health and the Speak for Health campaign. Now, a big thing you can do, this is one we encourage um, a lot, is actually schedule a meeting with your member of Congress, whether that's your senator or your representative in the House. Um, we encourage this so much because so many congressional staff, as you see here, 94% of congressional staff list the meetings that their members have with constituents as a huge part of how they make decisions um, in supporting legislation when it's in hearing, in markup, or being voted on on the floor of the Senate or the House. So just, just a quick meeting with your member of Congress to talk about public health is highly, highly influential, especially considering that, once again, you guys have so much public health expertise. We really want to, to use that. Of course, Don and I do a lot of work um, you know, advocating for certain things, setting up meetings, um, endorsing legislation. But the fact of the matter is that you guys live all over the place. Don and I live in D.C., but for instance, uh, a member of Congress from Tennessee is going to listen to an APHA member who lives in Tennessee a lot more keenly because you live and vote there. So as you're thinking about setting up these meetings, you know, not only try to set them up with your, your own members of Congress, but try to invite people in your network who also live and our constituents in your district to join you as well. Um, we have some tips here. There's a link here for finding who your elected official is. If you don't know that, I'm sure many of you already do, as well as some tips linked here for how to request a meeting. You know, what should go in that email? What should you be asking for? Um, and in a little bit, after I go through some of these resources, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what to expect when setting up a meeting with a member of Congress. Um, another resource that we provide that can be very helpful for you guys during the Speak for Health campaign is fact sheets. So we have a lot of different fact sheets. Some of them are issue-based fact sheets. So we have um, newly updated fact sheets on public health funding, on gun violence prevention, on racial equity. And in addition to those issue-based fact sheets, we also have some state fact sheets. Those are also being newly updated for 2023 and will be posted on the website soon for you to use in August. And those state fact sheets are super helpful because those, there's 51 of them, one for each state in the District of Columbia. And essentially what those state fact sheets do, they provide a breakdown of public health in your state. So if you live in California and you check out the California state fact sheet, it'll say, you know, California received this much funding from CDC and HRSA. 
in 2022. Um, here are some key public health issues that we're working through in California um, and the statistics on those. And here are some maybe successes for public health in California. And so those fact sheets are really helpful, you know, if you are having a phone call with a congressional office or setting up a meeting with a member of Congress's office. These are great conversation starters. Um, it's great to point to the public health funding going into your state and be able to say, you know, this is how much our state does rely on CDC and HRSA funding, which is why we should be advocating for more strengthened funding in the appropriations process. These are just generally a great resource for starting those conversations, as well as a great leave behind. Um, so you can leave it with the office to um, reference later or go over before the meeting. Um, another fun resource that we have is our congressional vote record. The 2023 version of that vote record is posted on the website and linked here. And that vote record is a summary of last year. Um, essentially what the vote record does, um, we collect several key public health votes that happened in this case over the course of 2022 and essentially rank members based on how they performed in those votes. So did they vote consistent with APHA stance on those votes? Um, essentially, did they vote in favor of pro-public health legislation, and did they vote against anti-public health legislation? And then we calculate up scores for each member. So, you know, we love to see 100% for members, um, and also in a lot of cases, there are those who receive less than 100%. But either way, this is a really helpful resource because if you have a great member of Congress for public health and they do have 100%, you know, don't forget to thank your member. If you make a phone call or set up a meeting with your member of Congress, bring that that vote record and say, like, we are like so proud to have a member who gets 100 percent on APHA's congressional vote record. You know, please keep up your like championship for public health. But also if they have less than 100 um, percent, uh, a lower percentage, you can, you know, kind of try to hold them accountable and say, um, you know, your constituents would love to see you be more active and more engaged on public health. Um, unfortunately, it looks like there are some, some moments in the congressional vote record where you didn't vote in an, uh, an aligned stance with APHA, but, you know, that can start a conversation about ways that they can be better, um, legislation that they could support to be a better champion for public health. Um, and finally, just some extra ways that you can um, get involved in advocacy and stay in the loop with what we are doing at APHA. Um, we have a bunch of resources that kind of summarize the work that we're doing here. One is our legislative update, which is posted on the website, as well as it goes out monthly to pretty much everybody um, who's uh, an APHA member. It goes to your email. And there's a monthly call as well where we summarize that legislative update. And the, the update just includes what have we endorsed and supported recently? What has Congress introduced that is relevant to public health? What are the agencies doing? What are courts doing? Things like that. We also post all of our letters to Congress and agencies on the website. So you can get a quick rundown of what we're supporting there, as well as we post the testimony, comments, and briefs that we are joining. So these are all resources that you can not just look at to stay in the loop with what we're working on, but these are things you can cite in your advocacy, right? Um, so if you are having a meeting with a member of Congress about climate change and environmental health, you can bring some of the recent EPA letters that we've joined with you um, to kind of talk about, okay, here's how APHA has engaged in environmental health advocacy lately, and this is what we would like to see you support. Now, I've kind of gone through most of the um, resources and tools that we provide you guys, whether you are a new advocate looking to jump into the, the pool of advocacy for the first time and need some tools and resources to support your efforts, or if you're a seasoned veteran and you set up meetings with your member of Congress all the time and you're just looking for ways to boost your existing efforts. 
um, those are all great things you can use. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna revisit the topic of uh, meeting with your member of Congress um, and go through some tips and tricks there because this, like I said, is so influential for members, um, but it's something that of course is a little intimidating for people that might not have done it before. But the thing is, it's actually really easy. It mostly involves emailing them, setting up the meeting, and then talking for 20 or 30 minutes. So once you've emailed them, um, in the process, you want to ask them, of course, for um, a date and a time that you can have a meeting with your member of Congress, as well as always go ahead and provide the topic. So say I'm here to talk about public health and environmental health, or I'm here to talk about abortion access, because that helps them um, proceed with the process of getting that meeting scheduled. Um, and you definitely want to, as you're setting it up, plan um, those logistics in advance. So are you going to their office in person? Is it a Zoom meeting? And if so, are you providing the link or are they providing the link? What time zone are you in? You wanna have those things confirmed. And the day of the meeting, you wanna make sure you start on time, um, get there a little bit early and respect the time of the, the people that you're meeting with. And the reality is in most cases, if you're scheduling a meeting with a member of Congress, um, the member may not actually be able to join that meeting, but in most cases, you'll be meeting with a member of the staff um, and the staff will report that information back to the member of Congress. Now, some more tips. You want to make sure that you're concise in your rundown of the topic. Um, this just goes back to being timely. You don't want to take up too much of their time. Generally, they just have 20 or 30 minutes for the meeting, but you want to kind of think through in your head beforehand, um, how am I going to get these points and give them evidence for what I'm talking about, ask them what legislation I want them to support or what issue I want them to lend their support to, as well as planning ahead is key, especially if this is a group. So like I said, it's really helpful if you, you know, recruit some of your colleagues and go in in a team. But if you're doing that, you want to make sure that you know what everybody's discussing so you're not talking over each other. So maybe have one of you open up with like the introduction of the topic. Maybe have the next person give state-specific examples. And then the last person do the ask. Like, we would like you to co-sponsor this legislation. Just make sure you kind of have an understanding of the flow of the meeting rather than improv it during, unless you're really good at improv. Um, and also be prepared to answer questions. The staff of the member will probably ask you about the topic. Um, they are probably not as much experts on the topic as you are, because as I've said, many of you are have such deep expertise in the issues of public health that you're talking about they're going to see you as an expert um, and ask you those questions. It's also fine if you don't know the answer immediately. That's an opportunity where you can say, I would love to get, circle back to you on this and make sure that I you know, provide you with accurate information, um, at which point after the meeting, it's important that you loop back to them and answer that question for them. Um, a really important part about these meetings is not just what happens during the meeting, but the relationship that you form going forward, um, which this next tip, it's important that you provide yourself as a resource for the policymaker and their staff. So a lot of the importance of congressional meetings is not like, what can you do for me today? What can you endorse or co-sponsor in the next week? <clears throat> it's kind of a long game, right? So a lot of these offices, it's important that you meet with them once a year or once every six months to kind of establish a relationship going forward so that they see you as an expert on the topic, they see you as a resource if they ever need information on anything public health related. And then over time, you know, you can grow their commitment to public health and their championship for public health. Um, it's all about making yourself a resource and maintaining a relationship with that office over time. Um, and as I mentioned before, in that meeting, you definitely want to provide materials to back up what you're saying, as well as leave behinds that they can reference later. So that can be some of the things we talked about, fact sheets, letters from our website, um, something that 
you know, if they're talking about it a week or two or a month from now, they can go back and reference those materials that you provided them. And of course, after the meeting is over, follow up with a thank you email, thank them for their time, um, offer to answer any questions that they might have in the future, and just generally continue to develop that relationship with the office. Um, so those are some quick tips and tricks for tips and tricks, yeah, um, for what you should expect and what you should do in a meeting with a member of Congress. But honestly, the the most important thing is these meetings are not as difficult or intimidating as you think if you've never done one before, especially with Zoom, like you can now do it from the comfort of your office or your home um, and rally together a group of people to go talk to them about the importance of public health and funding it and passing good pro-public health legislation. So we would love to see everybody here, not just um, use some of these tools, whether it's action alerts or planning meetings with your members of Congress or submitting an op-ed or attending a town hall. We would love to see you guys get involved in that during the month of August, during our Speak for Health campaign. But we'd also love to see you share some of these resources um, because as APHA leaders, you guys have networks and groups that you're parts of that you can influence to get involved in advocacy as well. Um, so we'd love to see that happen. Um, like I said, you will be getting some emails from us throughout the month of August. Um, once a week, we'll be sending emails with tools and resources you can use for advocacy and discussing some of our priorities more in depth. So if you guys could just share those emails and those resources with your groups and your networks, that would really just, you know, spread the, um, the impact of Speak for Health and ultimately grow the, the public health voice, which is our aim during the Speak for Health campaign. So at this time, does anybody have any questions about um, APHA's public health priorities, about the Speak for Health campaign, about the resources and tools that we provide for you or any of that? If so, you could just raise your hand and I will um, unmute you or ask you to unmute. Sure, Stephen. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, a question in meeting with the legislators, it's, it's always uh, an unanswered question for me, is how, how much time should be devoted to listening to uh, what the legislator, their positions and the actions they've taken versus what our position is? Any magic answer to that? That's a good question. Um... In most cases, I mean, in my experience with meetings, most of the meeting is, you know, you providing your perspective and your ask to them. Um, of course, if they have a deeper understanding of the issue or history with legislation related to that issue, they might be able to have more of a conversation. But in most cases, um, I would say they're mostly focused on asking questions um, asking about the data that supports your position and asking how they can support your, your issue. Would you agree with that, Don? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, it, you know, you might get, there are, there have been instances where I've been, <laughs> had been in meetings with somebody who really likes to talk. Um, but in general, usually, and usually that's because they're a fellow or something, <laughs> but because Hill staff, they usually, you know, these meetings will generally be 15 minutes, 30 minutes at, at the longest. Rarely they will go longer. Um, and so they're, you know, the staff have multiple meetings. And so they're probably going to just ask what they need uh, specifically. And often, oftentimes we'll say, um, you know, I'll take a, if you're, if you leave a packet behind or some fact sheets with them, they'll say, I'll take a look at these after the meeting. So um, it can vary, but I agree with Jordan that generally you're doing most of the talking um, and then just answering any questions. And if you don't know the answer to the question, you can just say, I'll get back to you. Um, don't feel like you have to answer every question on the spot. Um, and if it's something APHA related and you don't know the answer, you can ask me or Jordan. Um, if it's something on a, a subject matter issue, that you're just not an expert in that issue, I would suggest going, you know, if you know a colleague who is, ask them, um, you know, 
to give you some information and or you could put them in touch with the member's office as well if it's particularly if it's somebody who's also a constituent thank you and somebody somebody asked a question in the chat <clears throat> how we decided who to invite we generally for this um webinar we focus on leaders so section chairs um affiliate uh presidents and eds uh i think probably went to caucuses action board members so folks that we know have the ear of their the groups or the members of APHA that they represent um within their sections affiliates etc hoping that you will spread the word because we we often find that you know folks get a lot of uh, emails from me and Jordan and APHA in general. And then when they hear from a friendly, not a friendly, not that we're unfriendly, if they hear from a more familiar uh, person that they actually know, um, we hope that that helps with the uptake, that they'll pay maybe a little more attention um, uh, to reviewing the information that's coming from somebody that they um, know from their section or affiliate. I think we have a question in the chat about recommendations for government staff joining advocacy efforts and making sure that they're following the rules um, of their jobs. And we would say, of course, um, lean towards not breaking any rules at your job when you're when you're thinking about getting involved in advocacy. But we do, um, this is a little later, but if any of you are attending the annual meeting, um, which this year is in Atlanta, we have a session every single year at the annual meeting called um, Advocating in the Current Political Climate. And the entire goal of that session is to go over how people who do work for public health agencies in our state or government in any capacity how they can make sure that they're not breaking rules when they're in, engaging in advocacy and what the difference is between advocacy and lobbying. So when does advocacy cross over into lobbying? Um, and that session is run by lawyers who know the rules um, a lot better than most of us. Um, so if that's ever been a question for anybody here, I'd highly encourage you to take a look into that session if you're attending the annual meeting. It's called advocating in the current political climate. Yeah, I agree with Jordan. You should always, you know, ask your employer. <laughs> and if they say, no, you can't do that, even if they're wrong, I probably wouldn't do it. Um, and it's up to you to decide how you want to take it up the, you know, if you want to challenge that. Um, but a lot of times it's, you know, while you're on a lot of the, the restriction is like, you can't do it from the office. You can't do it on office equipment. You can't do it while you're quote unquote, on the clock. But if you're on vacation, you're taking a day off, personal day, et cetera, generally most people can, um, you know, advocate or even lobby um, at that stage. So, but yeah, if you're, if you're concerned or have questions, you should definitely talk to your employer first. We don't want to get you anybody into trouble and we can't offer you legal advice. <laughs> we also have a question um, about practicing congressional uh, meetings. Um, and I'd say you can definitely email me um, if you want to have a quick chat about practicing for a congressional meeting or any other tips. My email is jordan.wolf at apha.org. That's J-O-R-D-A-N dot W-O-L-F-E at apha.org. And I'll make sure our emails are in the slides and things that we provide to you guys if you have any other questions. Yeah, and we can also talk internally to see if there are other APHA members who would be open to um, uh, kind of mentoring people. Um, you know, we have, we obviously have other APHA members who have done this, some of them a lot. Um, and if they'd be interested in, um, you know, maybe we can talk about how we can pull together a list um, of folks uh, who would be willing to serve in that role as well. So we will, we will definitely talk about it. I think that's a good idea. Totally. Um, Celeste just pointed out that action board members are also available to help with a practice session. Thank you so much. I didn't, I didn't, Shirley was messaging me. I didn't want to, 
I didn't want to be the one to call out the action board, but Celeste can because she's on it and she's chair it. So yeah, that's, I think that's, that's probably one of the groups that's going to be the most helpful in in uh, serving that role as a mentor or a practice partner. And for anybody who doesn't know, APHA's action board is just the board tasked with encouraging advocacy efforts among all the members of APHA. So it's kind of their jobs to get involved in advocacy and share um, information about advocacy with everybody else at APHA. Yeah. And as leaders, you'll probably, you should be hearing from uh, action board members over the you know next several weeks, in addition to what the emails that you get from Jordan and I um, action, many of the action board members will also be reaching out to the sections that they are the liaisons to to encourage um, uh, the leaders to again encourage their rank and file members to participate. And I'm thinking we'll probably end up creating some kind of a Google document again this year where sections can go ahead and um, submit some of the things that they've done uh, for the Speak for Health campaign, because it is good to kind of see um, what folks are doing, because otherwise we kind of do this webinar and we ask people to do it and then we just don't know. So it's good. It's nice for us to hear feedback. So you can look forward to us sharing at some point a link um, later in the summer where you can go ahead and report any uh, interesting activities that you were able to undertake and encourage your section members to do the same. Awesome. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, well, I will stop the recording here. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us for the advocacy webinar. Um, we look forward to sending you guys lots of resources and tools over the next month. Um, and like I said, hopefully you're all able to get involved and share that with your networks. Thanks, everyone.